Welcome to episode two of the podcast series, The DNA Papers, the main aim of which is to tell us history of the discovery and understanding of the workings of DNA, the molecule, via a discussion of the seminal papers published about it beginning about 150 years ago. I'm Nirja Sankaran, and I will be the moderator for most of this series. In our first episode, we revisited the discovery of the actual material, originally introduced as nuclein, in 1869 by the Swiss biochemist Friedrich Miescher. Today, we continue that discussion by looking at work that picked up and directly built on Miescher's discovery. Specifically, we will be looking at a cluster of publications by a German physiological chemist named Albrecht Kossel, in which he identified and isolated key components of DNA, the nucleotide bases adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine, better known to most of our audience, perhaps, as A, T, G, and C. The papers were written in German. The first one, in 1879, was titled Über das Nuklein de Hefe, on the nuclein of yeast. The second paper in 1882 is titled Zur Chemie de Zellkant on the chemistry of the nuclei of cells. And the third paper, written four years later in 1886, is Weitere Beitrag zur Chemie de Zellkant, further contributions on the chemistry of nuclei of cells. Please excuse my really bad German pronunciation, but some of our guests will soon rectify that. Now, the value of Kossel's contributions were very well recognized in his own time, evidenced by the fact that he was the sole recipient of the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine in 1910. The prize specifically cited him for his contributions, and I quote, to the knowledge of cell chemistry made through his work on proteins, including the nucleic substances, end quote. But with few exceptions, Kossel's name and work remain underrepresented in most annals of DNA research, especially in the English language. Today's podcast aims to add something to that gap by talking about what made Kossel's work important enough for his contemporaries to recognize and why, more than a century later, it is worth our while to remember and his achievements and recognize their importance. Joining me today to illuminate and contextualize Kossel's contributions is a panel of distinguished scholars who will bring to bear their expertise in different aspects of his work. And rather than natter on myself, I'll lose no time in introducing them. In alphabetical order by last name, they are Panina Abiram, a historian of science perhaps best known in our community as a tireless champion of the underrepresented or the misrepresented in science. Her presence in this particular episode is linked to her very first publication in the history of science, a review undertaken while she was yet a graduate student of a book called A Century of DNA by Frank Portugal and Jack Cohn. This is one of the first books in English, I believe, to give Cossel his due recognition. This fact was specifically noted by Panina in her review, and I'm delighted to be able to welcome her to revisit the episode today. Thank you. Our next guest, Mark Lort, is a biological chemist and a science writer communicator who divides his day job at the University of Hull equally between these expertises. Mark is also the author of several books Notably, and most relevantly for our purposes today, a book on biochemistry, a very short introduction, part of the Oxford University Press's very short introduction series in science. All these avatars of Marx are highly relevant in the context of today's discussion, which is, after all, about some foundational advances in chemistry and biochemistry that need better public exposure or better communication to the public. I was stoked to have found him and to have persuaded him to join today's discussion. Thank you, Mark. Pleasure to be here. Really looking forward to it. Rounding out today's discussion is Hans-Jörg Reinberger, now Director Emeritus of Max Planck Institute for History of Science in Berlin, where he served as an actual director from 1997 to 2014. 
be it philosophy, biology, sociology, molecular genetics, linguistics, or chemistry. Hans Jörg has studied them all, and I do mean actually studied versus dabbled in. His presence in today's session is especially important since it was he who stressed the gap in the modern-day awareness of Kossel and his work. Very pleased to have you here, Hans Jörg. Yeah, thank you. Hi. Thank you all once again for participating. And I'm going to begin by asking the speakers to immediately dive in and tell us something about the content of these papers, whose titles I mangled so badly, and what made them and makes them so important. Why should our listeners know and care about them? Hans Jörg, as the person in this group who has read these papers in the original German, may I request you to go first and share your thoughts. Tell us a little bit about the content of the papers, please. What are these papers about? Yeah, as you can see, they have been written between 1879 and 1886, when Kossel had actually studied with Hoppe Seiler at the University of Strasbourg. You probably know that Strasbourg, which actually is a French city in the Alsace, became German after the Franco-German War in 1870. And uh, the Germans started to, to build a new university there um, in the early 1870s and tried to attract the best people uh, to Strasbourg. Among them was Hoppe Seiler, and you know that Friedrich Mischer has also been a student of Hoppe Seiler, although that was when Hoppe Seiler still was at the University of Tübingen. So there are different places involved. Kossel actually finished uh, his studies in, in the north of Germany at the University of Rostock, and then was hired by Emile Dubois-Raymond uh, to his new institute uh, of uh, physiology. So Emile Dubois-Raymond is, is a big, has been a big figure of 19th century physiology, in, in particular electrophysiology, and he wanted to have somebody who was trained in biological chemistry. And so he hired Kossel. Um, and he stayed in Berlin for a number of years and uh, started actually to work on what he had learned uh, with Hoppe Seiler. And in Hoppe Seiler's lab, of course, nuclein was a theme since Misha had discovered it and Kossel had become interested in these substances, not only nuclein, but also in proteins when he was studying with uh, Hoppe Seiler and later on also spent a few years as an assistant of Hoppe Seiler in Strasbourg. So that's ba actually the background and he continued uh, to work on this topic throughout his career so he didn't change it very much. So he was working on nucleins and also on proteins uh, for about 30 years um, from the late 1870s to the 1910s, uh, when he actually stopped doing laboratory work himself. Yeah, and the selection of papers is um, from the earlier time. And what he does here is to report on uh, the different nucleic acid bases that he had been able to identify with chemical means, basically and which then in the end ended up as the quadruple of uh, thymine, adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. And well, thanks for that summary. So I you know, take it that this is the, the crux of it, isn't it? That he, these papers are where he presents those bases, those, those, those that we're now so familiar with, the, the, the guanine, adenine, thymine, and cytosine, as you, as you say. And for me, you know the the chemistry in these papers is 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 lovely to see, but I think really the most one of the most significant points for me is actually 
the fact that, of course, he named these bases, yeah, apart from guanine, which had already been named, in, you know, he gave them the names adenine, thymine, cytosine. And so the now familiar alphabet of DNA, the A, T, Gs and Cs that you'll see on your screens and in textbooks and everywhere are puzzles. And that's to me, is his most familiar and visible legacy is those letters that are now so common. And in a way, we I think modern day bioinformatics and biochemists and so on ha- ha- should be really thankful to him that he didn't he didn't use the same letter twice at the beginning of uh, uh, he didn't choose something else. If we'd had two bases beginning with G, it would have been dreadfully confusing. Now, for all of us working today, we are, but instead he came up with these four lovely uh, lovely names, and you know that we're also now so familiar with. Yeah, so I could answer with a book title of Stephen Tulmin, Foresight and Understanding. <laughs> <laughs> of course, he had clues or he had kind of reasons to choose uh, these names. He could have chosen other ones. Yeah. So, and we would today, we would stay then with the other ones. But he obviously felt uh, that he should give them compact and pronounceable names and not the long chemical formulas, which he could also have done, yeah, pyrimidine and so on and so on and so on, which he did obviously did not do. And I mean, we know all from history of science that in one way or the other, naming is an important strategy of um, of getting things into people's heads. Do you think, in a way, he because guanine had already been named, hadn't it, by Heinrich is it Christoph Magnus in back in eighteen forty four? You know, and the the other the other names, adenine, thymine, cytosine, all all follow that same style. You know, they're compact, they're ending in. You know, which is lovely as well because, of course, it means derived from, but it also means contains nitrogen. So he was following that naming convention that already been tentatively started, I suppose, wasn't he? Nina, you had something to say. Yeah, I just wonder if somebody knows how many other organic chemists or chemists of natural products, which this falls under, were interested in the bases in uh, either Germany or other countries. Was Kossel a lone star or were there others? I could not tell you actually whether at the time he was actively working in the laboratory where whether there were other laboratories somewhere in the world uh, that were working on the same topic and even kind of entered into some kind of competition. I am at least not not aware of that. Well, I assume that the people who invited him to give the Harvey Lecture in 1912 were specifically interested in his work. Otherwise, they could have invited another illustrious German or non-German. Yeah, but in, in 19, 1912, it was just two years that he had gotten the Nobel Prize. So. Well, yeah, you know, sometimes... And uh, also the Nobel Prize itself, it means that uh, uh, Karolinska, which is very conservative in general... <laughs> So this is important, and I do not recall if in uh, 1910 they used to consult outside Sweden, which they do now, but at that time it was a very local affair. So in Scandinavia there was some interest in these bases or in nucleic acids in general, but otherwise uh, maybe not so much. But in 1910, I mean, that's a long, that's quite a long time later, isn't it? If he started his work on these, the 1870s and 80s, you know, probably I imagine that at the time that this was quite niche, but it was, it wasn't, it wouldn't have been until much later that it became more obvious how important his work was. We are having a problem that he, in his papers, if you go through them and if you read them, they are really very dryly written. It's just reporting what he had done in the laboratory and then his highlights, uh, the names, so they they flash into into one's eye. Uh, But on the other hand, that is also something that you can easily grasp uh, from this 1879 quote on the little expose on page three. 
if you would like to have a look at where Kossel refers to Pasteur, who obviously had uh, found already uh, in the late 1850s that nitrogenous substances are present in higher amounts when yeast is fermenting actively. And so, of course, what he had in his mind is that this must have something to do with the reproductive cycle of yeast. Yeah? Otherwise, why should it be there in higher amounts when it is actively fermenting uh, than uh, when it is resting? And so I think these kinds of clues, we have to pay attention uh, to them in order to understand why he focused on these substances of the nucleus. Whereas the Nobel Prize Committee in Stockholm, and so we can go back to the quote, uh, he got his prize for, as it reads, knowledge of cell chemistry made through his work on proteins. And then comes a, a by sentence, including nucleic substances. So for the Nobel Committee, proteins were in the foreground and nucleic substances were not. This point is important because the entire history of nucleic acids is that of being overshadowed by the greater centrality of proteins. And we don't really know exactly, other than this citation from 1910 of the Nobel Committee, which is usually populated by very conservative types, that nucleic acids are some kind of second-rate citizen in comparison with proteins. And the only disadvantage that these people think nucleic acids have is that proteins are very diverse in components. And if you think of reproduction and many traits, even though they didn't have ideas of codes at the time, you need a lot of components. So proteins were central because it could provide a trivial way by which biological diversity could be reflected in chemical diversity. And nucleic acids with four or five sources of diversity appeared without the idea of a code. You cannot think how they can possibly do a job in reproduction. So this is jumping a little ahead, right, from the 1870s and 1880s. I just would like to go back to the quote uh, about Pasteur that hans mentioned. Pasteur found that during fermentation, there was a marked increase in the nitrogenous substances in yeast. And then in brackets, Kossel added, in question mark, nucleins. So basically asking, could these be nucleins? And I think this is where... The paper starts to get interesting, especially for a modern reader who's not a chemist, that already he was considering the function of these new substances in processes like fermentation. Would any of you like to comment on that? Well, fermentation was much more central at the time because of uh, a bit of its basic importance, basic science, but primarily all the industries there, beer, wine, and other things, dependent on fermentation and uh, the absence of disease of fermentation. So uh, people, you know, when you ask why Kossel's work was not at the center of action, we also need to ask what was at the center of action. And this is the era of not only fermentation for industrial purposes, but diseases uh, that Koch and Pasteur, people are concerned whether they're going to die of infections or not. So this looks very marginal and uh, unexciting compared to uh, other topics. And yet it was recognized for a prize. And yet, and this is what I found interesting, that he's tying it to things that are people are finding interesting, like fermentation. Uh, anybody else care to comment on that, please? Yeah, um, I mean, we should not forget, uh, we are now looking at some uh, physiological chemistry and we are looking at the prominence of uh, proteins at that time. And as uh, Pnina rightly says, um, they were much, uh, turned out to be much more diverse in constituents, in building blocks, 
than the uh, nucleic acids. Uh, but this was something that was in the process of being identified in, in that time between 1870 and 1900 in these 30 years. But on the other hand, we should also not forget uh, that we have a parallel uh, development in cytology at that time. The identification of the nucleus had happened already a little bit earlier, but chromosomes had been identified and as main constituents of the nucleus and as something that appears to be very central to proliferation of cells. And Misha had identified nuclein, and the name comes from that, as a substance that obviously occurs in significantly greater amounts in the nucleus than in the cytoplasm or in the protoplasm, as it was called that time. So that is also something, if we kind of widen a little bit our horizon, we have parallel developments in the late uh, 19th century in cell biology and in biological chemistry, and which gives rise and possibilities to speculate what these substances could possibly be responsible for in the cell. But there is another aspect to that. The way science develops at that time, and especially in Germany, but in other places as well, these are uh, disciplinary fiefdoms. There are uh, autocrats that rule over a discipline, and nobody dares pronounce in a particular discipline if one is not a member of it. So even if Kassel had some inkling, like uh, Nirja uh, said, that this might relate somehow to nuclein's role in reproduction, they wouldn't talk about another discipline. This um, epistemology of disciplinary partition of knowledge and power prevents the discovery of the genetic function of nucleic acids. Yeah. Because what is important about them is not the uniqueness of the chemical structure, which is ordinary by chemical standards, but the function. But those who know the structure don't dare speak of the function and vice versa. Cytology, cytology cytogeneticists have no clue about this uh, biochemical and chemical. So it's a knowledge that falls in between, between the chairs and there is nobody to pronounce. I think those quotes from that 1879 paper about the nuclein in yeast is, is really telling in that you know, the, the quote about Pasteur, Pasteur found the fermentation there occurs as a marked increase in those nitrogenous substances which are insoluble in dilute sulfuric acid. So that's key, isn't it? Because because the, the that last part, because that's telling him that these aren't proteins, these are something else. Of course, proteins are plenty of nitrogen in them as well. So he's cottoned on to the fact that these are, as I said, different. Are they the nucleins, as he comments? And then later on in the paper, isn't there, he says there's a not insignificant quantity of hypoxanthine, okay, which is it's essentially a, um, a derivative of the DNA basis. And these are found among the soluble cleavage products of nuclein, and the investigation of which has not yet been completed. But the point here is that he's starting to realise that these are something that produced during fermentation, during when these, these cells are replicating, that it's not there, it's not necessarily there for housekeeping, you know, just maintaining the culture and the organism. It's there when it's reproducing and, and dividing. And so I, I, I see in that those tentative you know glimmers of inspiration that maybe this is something to do with reproduction and so on and of course you know showing that takes many many years before that was that was nailed down but in a way that's one of the first um tentative thoughts along those lines yeah that this becomes uh, particularly visible in the 1882 paper where he explicitly rejects uh, the suggestion that nuclein could be what he calls a reserve substance, something uh, that, uh, that uh, organisms uh, draw upon when they do not have enough food. And he said it is, or uh, his assumption would be that it is related to tissue formation, and which means um, cell division in a way. Yeah? And we should possibly also not forget 
that among the teachers of Kossel in Strasbourg was Wilhelm Waldeier. And he has been one of the big figures of chromosome research in the 1870s and the 1880s. So he came across these things from his teachers, other than Hoppe Seiler. He, had, he did not only study with Hoppe Seiler there. But there is no collaboration between your guy in Strasbourg. What's his name in Strasbourg? Waldeier. Waldeier and uh, Kossel, because you cannot collaborate across disciplinary boundaries at that time. And if we don't get that, epistemology is partitioned. It's like in, in, uh, boundaries that nobody can cross. And this is one of the basic uh, issues in the rise of molecular biology, that it uses bodies of knowledge that are uh, partitioned in almost contrasting and even contradictory, not only methodologies, but metaphysics. And people think you either belong to that or to that. You cannot combine. These people do not contemplate a collaborative project, which could have lived. Pnina, please be aware of the fact in the decades uh, just before 1900, we, we have a situation where these disciplinary boundaries are rather fluid. You have organic chemistry, but you also have biochemistry um, situating itself apart from organic chemistry and also apart from analytical chemistry and also relate itself to, uh, to medical physiology, what traditionally was called physiology. So these boundaries where to a certain extent at that time, these were fluid boundaries. And I think the particular passage that Hans-Jörg just mentioned is sort of an idea that sort of reiterates that idea, or reinforces that idea that the boundaries were fluid because Kossel is clearly thinking about does nuclein have a function in tissue formation? And he goes on to elaborate, and I'm just going to read out that last part in translation, of course. Um, Similar considerations prompted me to compare the nucleic content of a rapidly growing embryonic cell with that of a near adult individual. And in the former, that is in the growing embryonic cell, the nuclein content is considerably greater. And so once again, it reiterates the fact that he is thinking beyond just what is the chemistry and he is evidently crossing those fuzzy disciplinary lines. Absolutely. You know, and going back to Hans Jorg's point about these not being a reserve substance, you know, this is, of course, at the time we have this material people aren't sure what it does as Bina was saying you know proteins are very much paramount they're the they're they're much more interesting as far as everybody's concerned you can see the complexity of life almost in microcosm within proteins this nuclein and nucleic acids as they became known later are much far less interesting in a way but the the fact that the they he's looked at this he's gone well they it isn't a reserve substance because you don't see it in muscle for example or don't see it as in such great quantities in muscle which you'd expect maybe to have a lot more requirement for a reserve substance but you do see it in rapidly dividing cells like in the pancreas and the thymus which is of course where you know thymine gets its name from he got it from literally, you know, hundreds of kilograms of, of calf thymus and pancreas and so on as, as well, where he got the adenine from. So, you know, so he's, 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 he's tying this together, isn't he? The, the, the biochemistry, the chemistry with what he knows about the physiology of the, the organism where he's got it from and drawing these conclusions about what the material that he's working with might be for. Sweet breads, effectively. Yes, but biochemistry was referred by... A- analytical and organic chemists as dirty chemistry. <laughs> I think they still do call, call it dirty. And no respectable organic or analytical chemistry. They would look free. And, if you don't, and a lot of people would be influenced by this attitude. But I think that might explain why Kossel got his Nobel Prize in medicine and not in chemistry you know, even though his work was clearly chemical. 
the arguments about which category um, discovery should fall into, that uh, as far as the Nobel Prize Committee goes, is an argument that happens every year, you know, right up to the modern day, isn't it? So it would be really interesting to go and see the historical context. I agree. You see how it was happening, you know, over a century ago as well. Yeah. It's a very good question, and I suggest that you or someone else investigate the Nobel archives for 1910 are open. Please investigate what was the discussion to give him the Nobel in physiology and not in chemistry. It's a very good question. You know, the Binia received the Nobel in both. Yeah, I think with respect to this division, the Nobel Committee has, uh, there is a lot of opportunism involved in where somebody is placed to get his or her Nobel Prize. If they have already one for chemistry, they need the other one to fill it up and the other way around. So if you look at the history of this. Uh, but I, I, what I find interesting is that more than three generations later, to come back to Erwin Chagav, Erwin Chagav had exactly the same argument now mm-hmm. for um, molecular biology against biochemistry. Molecular biology was the dirty, fuzzy thing, and biochemistry was the right thing. Yes, thank you for foreshadowing that. And I'm very delighted that uh, you're going to come back and talk about Shargav's paper for a future episode. But to get back to Kossel, uh, one of the things I'd like to do is personalize this a little bit and ask the three of you to recount how and where you first encountered, because you all come from different backgrounds, as I pointed out, and it's, I think it would be very interesting for our readers to kind of learn how and when you first encountered Kussel's work, what struck you about it, and, you know, which also brings us to what makes it interesting, you know, by learning what made it interesting to you, what made it interesting to the readers. And please pick this up in any which order you like. I was just lucky. I was a student at the University of Montreal in Canada, and the university, uh, not the university, my institute, had a, an exchange program with Johns Hopkins. And one of the professors of, from Johns Hopkins, Robert Cargan, was friends with the ISIS book review editor, Bernard Finn, who was a historian of technology and would not have heard of me or I of him. But when, since he visited Montreal, Cargon told him, look, there is a student here that is not interested in anything else except the history of molecular biology. And she can review this new, fresh new book for you. So I received the, the book, A Century of DNA, and I was very much interested in the book because it was straight to my interest. And I worked quite hard on it. It was my first ever publication, my first ever review. Turned out that it was a genre that I did a lot later. And it was published eventually in June 1978 in ISIS. And sometimes I forget that I have a publication in the 70s because most of my staff is in the 80s beginning the 80s. A follow-up question is, the book has many chapters, and obviously, in a short review, you cannot give all the chapters equal or even mention. You only mention things that stand out. And you mention Kussel, and you mention Amphibus Levine, but we'll get to that later. You mention Kussel specifically. So what made that jump out at you then? Well, that's an important question that I hope I'll have a good answer. Those of us who were active in the, I can't say active, I was a student, you know, in the late 70s, what everybody was impressed to is that DNA research was a new paradigm, was a turning point. Everything that went before was nothing or nothing went before. And I was impressed with uh, both Kossel and Levine as doing DNA research before what was considered the big turning point of DNA structure of the double helix. So they seem to me like classical types of pioneers that somehow fell in the shadow, some kind of Mendels of DNA types. And since, as you said, I'm always interested in those who are misrepresented, 
<laughs> I uh, looked at Castle and Levine as prototypes of people who were ahead of their time, who actually anticipated in a less articulate way uh, what happened later. And this is why they got uh, a bit of my attention. It is this idea to get a historical baggage put before these uh, wild horses of the double helix that nothing that happened before mattered. So this is why I singled them out, which I think is the reason why we that we all share. It is some kind of, uh, which shows you that the interest in this substance was much longer. But at the same time, it is also the surprise that Prior to Chargaff's work, nobody made a connection between the basis uh, ratios and a process of replication. This is also important. Hans-Jörg, would you go next? I'll repeat the question if you wish. When did you first encounter Kossel and his work and what made you pay attention to it? After all, you were the person who brought it to my attention for this podcast. So I'm especially interested to hear your input. Uh, I think I, I, I will have to make a confession. I started to occupy myself with Kossel when you asked me to join uh, <laughs> this, uh, this enterprise here in which we are now involved. I myself, as a historian and a historian of biology, never or early on decided not to work on DNA because the first wave of historians of molecular biology all jumped into DNA. And I thought, okay, let them go with DNA. Um, I'm interested in what molecular biologists are, are finding out about not the structure of proteins, but how proteins are produced in the cell. And that's what I have been historically doing. But actually, Kossel uh, came to my mind as somebody who, yeah, as, as a forgotten person. And it was a kind of coincidence uh, that you came up with the idea of doing this con these conversations that I also got uh, from an apothecary couple uh, from Rostock, a little biography of Kossel. So they are citizen historians, so to say, yeah? And uh, they, there is practically there is not much literature about Kossel. And they just a year or two years ago, they sent me their little book, which they wrote about Kossel and Rostock and uh, yeah, uh, the grandson of, of, of Rostock uh, who got the Nobel Prize in 1910 and so on and so on. It's a little bit celebratory, but it, it's a nice history of his life. And so... When you asked me, I thought, okay, there is Kossel. So if uh, Levine is coming into the picture in these conversations, we possibly, and if Misha is coming into the picture, we should possibly also look uh, into this intermediary person, the one who is between Misha and Phoebus Fib Levine. And that was the reason why I pointed out to you that there is a German biological chemist that possibly we should also have a look at. May I ask quickly if Hans Jörg knows a bit about the cultural place of Kossel in Germany? Because I read in the materials that you sent that he didn't like what he saw in Berlin. And this speaks very well for him because Berlin is the capital of Prussia. And Prussia brought Germany to disaster on two occasions. So he was a person, in my opinion, that because of his Hanseatic heritage was more open to the Northern Europe countries and even America. So uh, this will make him an atypical German uh, in a positive way. So I think we should pay attention to that too. Yeah, so I think there is uh, something to it and... He quite obviously um, was not very kind of fond of Berlin when he spent uh, a number of years there and was happy uh, to go back into um, smaller places like Marburg and in the end to Heidelberg, also very traditional 
university town in Germany, where he actually succeeded no one less than Hermann von Helmholtz. So at his time, he was a prominent figure in the academic context, although he was not a very outgoing person. So kind of very, so he was from North Germany in that. I think that's a good description. And he was also not enthusiastic about German politics that led Germany into uh, the First World War. He kind of was very, very kind of uh, reluctant with respect to these kind of political aspects of the German Kaiserreich at uh, his time. Yes. Wonderful. How about you, Mark? When did you encounter Kossel? So hand Jörg's answer about having overlooked Kossel so so much and lets me off the hook a little because I have to confess, despite having written a book recently by Chemistry, a very short introduction there, I didn't include him at all in the book. I did look back through my notes and I have a page in my notebook that says bits I left out and he is at least mentioned there. But so, so at least I must have been dimly aware of him. But of course, the great and, and it's such a shame, actually, that I wasn't aware of him and nor is so many other people, because, of course, he did give us the letters that make up the DNA alphabet that we are all so familiar with, the A, T's, G's and C's. They're everywhere. Uh, we see them plastered around on me- media and books and films and so on. And it's Kossel that gave us those letters. So It's a real shame that I wasn't more aware of him, but I'm really delighted to have been introduced and been able to delve into these papers from, you know, the the late um, 1870s, 80s, 90s and so on, discover so much more about this um, remarkable chemist. Okay, thank you. The other thing I would like to ask is, Hans Jörg brought up this comment by Kossel from a much later paper in 1921, again written in German, where he talks about and it's related to this issue of language, so you speak, you talk about the letters. And it's a very long quote, so I'm only going to read it out in English. It's the best approximation of a translation. And then I would very much like all three of you to comment on this before we bring our overall discussion to a close. And one of the reasons I should back up and say that this struck me is, again, because Nucleins were a class of substance completely different from proteins. That's what Miescher thought, and that's evidently what Kossel begins as well. And he's reiterating this point in a very different way here. He talks about innumerable hereditary factors are transferred during fertilization and must be present in the smallest dimension in the fertilized egg. Today, we can hardly imagine any better way to determine so many form and substance deciding structures in a small place than by relating them to the arrangement of molecules and atoms. Once again, extremely prescient, as all three of you actually have pointed out. Going back to the quote, chemical imagination offers us an inexhaustible range of combinations in space that are measured by the smallest fraction of a cubic millimeter. I just want to remind you that a protein molecule can contain as many as about as many building blocks as there are letters in the alphabet. But that combination of letters represents all of our literature. But the protein building blocks are not the only components of those structures which transmit hereditary disposition. Next to them, we can find other substances, namely the nucleins, that can increase the possibility of combinations ending my paraphrased quote. Comment, please. Yeah, it's an interesting, that kind of, you could read it as a blueprint for Erwin Schrödinger's code script. Yeah? And we also have to remind ourselves of the fact that Friedrich Miescher was already using this kind of metaphor of the alphabet in his conversation and his letter exchange with an anatomist of his time, Wilhelm Hiss. His uncle. Later, a colleague of Misha uh, in Basel. So it is it's already present in, obviously not in published, in a published form, in Misha's uh, published papers, but in his conversation and exchange with colleagues, he was using that. And I think uh, that Kossel kind of continues or picks it up and continues this tradition. But it's, uh, it's true, it's, it was a trope in the literature, 
But for nucleic acid, it was a killer because the metaphor of the alphabet enshrines the superiority of proteins as a source of chemical diversity and therefore of biological diversity. And you could not be there. And all the secondary status of nucleic acids comes from that. And it goes, as Hans Jörg said, from Michel onward till Schrödinger that broke this possibility. That uh, you, you have a match between chemical and biological diversity. That you can have biological diversity without chemical diversity via a code. This is Schrödinger. Just to add that, you know, I think it's really telling, isn't it, that, I mean, the, the, the using the alphabet metaphor that was still so, you know, is, is absolutely prevalent today is, is fascinating to see this sort of, sort of metaphor um, being used back in the 1920s. And it's really interesting to see how how is thinking about the role of, of nucleic acid, nuclein and so on, has developed. You know, this last paper in 1921, some 30 years uh, well, actually, no. It's fit, almost fifty. Where is it? Fifty. Yeah. It, it, it's it's forty. Yeah, for over forty years. This paper is so over forty years after the, the one of the first papers we discussed in the eighteen seventy nine. You know where he talked about um, where maybe the tentative ideas that nuclear might and nucleic acid might have been something to do with inheritance. You know, first appeared, and you know, forty years later, he's he can't quite can't quite bring himself to to nail his you know his flag to the mast to to say that he want you know that to 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 say what is what what he might be believing you know that 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 these are the molecules of inheritance of course it's it's quite a still quite a long way before a long time before before that is finally shown to be the case but it's it's again really interesting to see how these ideas are building and of course as as, as we've said the formulation of that alphabet metaphor and the noticing the many different building blocks in proteins of course you know they are the uh, the amino acids that we're you now very familiar with yeah great great to see that development over those processes really wonderful set of papers as well very well chosen loved loved seeing the development of those ideas throughout them so thanks for that could you give some idea of, I mean, you gave uh, the quote, and it's a wonderful quote, but what was that overall paper about? Was it a synthesis of his life's work and projecting forward, or was it a one-off, like a research paper, like his earlier papers? hans This is a synthesis work about 10 years after he had the Nobel, and it is, he read this paper before the Heidelberg Academy of Sciences. And the title in German is Über die Beziehung der Biochemie zu den morphologischen Wissenschaften. On the relation between biochemistry and the morphological sciences. That is uh, the title of this uh, summarizing lecture that he gave, gave at the early 1920s. And morphology, it's interesting, so also with respect to the notion of morphology, because if you go back to Claude Bernard um, already, who was basically writing these things around the, the 1860s and the 1870, he died in 1878, I think, was in a way taking up the notion of morphology that is actually an anatomical uh, notion. Yeah? It is about form and of course corresponding to that about form and function. That is morphology. But he uh, already Claude Bernard tried to use uh, this uh, and divert this notion into the molecular realm or in, in the atomic realm uh, by imagining that there must be some kind of formative or form-centered activity within the cells and, of course, connected uh, to substances that occur within the cell. And Kossel, in a way, does the same here. It's all been extremely fascinating. I'd like to thank you all for joining me today, and I hope our listeners are going to get as much out of this as I have. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Hans-Jörg. Thank you, Panina.